Um, I'm Chris Lintot. I'm, as of four days ago, the lead editor for the AAS journals for software data, instrumentation, and laboratory astrophysics which I need to rearrange into an acronym as soon as possible. Um, and I just want to highlight a couple of early thoughts and changes in those fields, which I think are exciting and important for our community. Um, I don't want to miss anyone out, so I should say that for laboratory astrophysics, Steve Federman of Toledo University is continuing as the scientific editor. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing more papers on that topic. Um, but in the other areas, we think there are, there are changes afoot. Um, for instrumentation, we have George Jacobi joining us as scientific editor. Um, the journals have always published excellent and important uh, papers describing instruments and telescopes and, and missions. In fact, they're some of the most highly cited papers in the journals. Um, but we're very aware that the standard paper is not necessarily the best way to report uh, on projects that might have a 10 to 20 year lifetime from design through to uh, deployment. Um, and we've noticed a demand in the community for uh, core papers which can update. Um, so a good example of this, not in our journals, is the LSST system paper, which sits on AstroPH and is updated every couple of years with new details on the design and indeed new authors. And so it's our intention to work with the Institute of Physics who provide the back end for the journals to make that possible uh, for system papers in AIS journals. I don't think there'll be many of these, certainly most papers won't need to update, but there will be important papers where that functionality is useful. And so if that's of interest to anyone, uh, please do let me know. We'll be looking for some uh, test papers to go through that system. Um, on the side of data, there's an awful lot of invisible work going on behind the paper that you view to make sure that the systems that power the papers and the power of the journals can cope with the idea of data that doesn't just exist in a machine-readable table or in a figure that's been prepared by the author. Um, you'll hear more about what we're doing with that from uh, my colleague Gus Mensch uh, towards the end of this session. Um, we're looking at new ways to do interactive figures and to allow people to present data, um, for example, in a 3D plot or in a plot that could be manipulated. Um, but this is also the place where our journals link to the wider ecosystem. And so, for example, we're looking at ways uh, to ensure that data that's presented in our journals gets into the CDS system, uh, which provides Simbad and, and the other search tools uh, that many astronomers use as quickly as possible. And indeed, the, those reading our journals can go quickly from the paper through to uh, some useful interface on CDS or elsewhere uh, that will allow them to interact with the data rather than just consume it. Um, the flip side of that is that we will need to introduce standards uh, for how authors submit data. Um, some of these will be uh, relatively straightforward. You know, we'll need access to actual data, just not the flat uh, figure that's produced as a, a PDF or a PS file. Um, but some of those may be trivial but controversial, you know, deciding how coordinates should be reported, for example. I'm sure we'll have many conversations about that uh, in the rest of the year. So really this is a, a reminder that there's lots happening. If you have ideas for how you'd like your figures or your data to be presented, you should contact us, um, but also to look out for those consultations that are coming later in the year. And the piece that's, that's really closest to my heart and where we've made progress already is in the publication of papers about software in the AAS journals. It was very clear that the software policy, which I think was last updated uh, about 15 years ago, uh, had been left behind by the pace of change within astronomy. And so there is a new policy on software in the AAS journals, uh, which went live on the 1st of January. Um, I was very pleased to, to note that it, at the beginning, uh, says that our journals should reflect the importance of software to the community, um, that clear communication of software and about software is essential, uh, and also that it, we have a very strong role in giving credit to those members of our community who spend a lot of their time building software. I think there's, there's a real problem in the contributions to pipelines, to, to general purpose software, to particular projects through software are not recognized easily um, under the existing structure. And so we fix that. So to be very clear, software papers are now perfectly acceptable in both 
of our main journals, the Astrophysical Journal and the Astronomical Journal, um, and those papers need not um, have a scientific result in them. So in the past, if you wanted to write a software paper, you had to combine that with the results of using that software. It's now perfectly acceptable to write a short paper that describes a piece of software that's used by astronomers to do research. Um, I think we've opened uh, the floodgates. I've always met so many people at this meeting who have immediately told me they're going to go home and write these papers. Um, they can be short. Um, this doesn't have to be a 55-page mag magnum opus. It could be a concise, clear description of what your software does and why it's useful and why it's novel. Um, and my hope is that by doing this, we create, A, a useful record for the community, but we also give the people who contribute by uh, producing software something to put on their CVs that's already recognised by the community. There's a lot going on in terms of alternative metrics and other ways of keeping track of contributions to the software but our community values publication through papers, and it values highly cited publications through papers, and my bet is that these software papers will go on to be extremely popular. To help me um, cope with that, um, we've recruited Tom Rubitai as a science editor for the area of software, in an analogous position, I think, to the statistics editor that we heard about earlier. Tom is the leading force behind the AstroPi, um, software package, which is the most used, I think, in, in astrophysics across a broad range of areas, uh, and he's looking forward to receiving your papers. Uh, the policy also includes more technical details on how we think papers and code should be cited. We've explicitly said we'll accept uh, a DOI for, for code, so uh, one can create a, a readable permanent link to a repository, and there are instructions in the policy on how might one might do that. And we're looking forward to working with ADS over the course of this year to make sure those things are cited as well. Of course, people can carry on using services that they've already used, like um, the Astronomy Software Code Library, um, which provides a valuable service for curating code. Um, these are important changes. They seem like small things, I think, uh, but rewriting the software policy will, I hope, lead to a new flood of papers uh, and a whole load of documentation which will end that frustrating uh, search for the web page on somebody's departmental web server from 20 years ago that describes the code that you're using. Thank you. How will you handle versioning? As we all know, software has bugs and they'll get reported at some point. Yeah, so, so, so the question of, of software versioning is important. So uh, a paper should describe a package and, and, and that will have a, a version associated with it. It may be that these updating papers are appropriate for some of the big packages. Um, in terms of the specific thing that you're citing, the DO, one of the advantages of um, creating a DOI to cite your software is it ties to a, a particular version of the repo. So we'll be able to know not just which code was used, but which version of the code was used for a paper. So I think that's an advance on where we were before. It creates the problem of then having to collate those so that we understand it's a single software package being cited over many versions. Um, and that's why I think these dual modes of citing are very useful. The paper allows a generic description of a code which can be cited and which can exist over many versions. The DOI allows you to link to the version of the code that you particularly used. And so I think in practice, the best case is for people to use both. And there are more details of this on the software, software policy. And I, I'm happy to sit and talk about it in detail if that's useful. So the future DOI would refer back to the earlier DOIs for a different version of The idea is that we'll tie those together, yeah, exactly.